The session is about um, factors predicting outcome in relation to sports injury and musculoskeletal problems. So without further ado, um, my topic is really to talk about um, the fragile athlete. And we talk a lot about the fragile athlete in the context of coaching. Um, it's a typical term, the fragile athlete, athlete being seen as one who is difficult psychologically to co coach. But from a musculoskeletal perspective, um, we really talk about this in relation to the predisposition to illness or injury. And I'm just going to focus on the adult athlete today and focus on um, musculoskeletal issues and how we define the fragile athlete or how we recognize, um, because there's a lot of it about, um, and um, what interventions we probably all actually practice but don't necessarily consciously um, do so. So the first um, challenge is really identifying the fragile athlete. So if we look at these two athletes, which of these two is fragile? And typically, one would choose the athlete on the, the athlete's makeup on the right. So this is the archetypical um, fragile athlete that perhaps pops into the mind of many clinicians when we're talking about fragility. Lightweight athletes, typically female, low body mass, low body fat, reduced energy intake, all sorts of hormones and um, musculoskeletal issues, which I'll come back to. But what about this athlete? Uh, if Shaquille O'Neal was running down the ba uh, basketball court at me, I would not stop to think, is he fragile? But in fact, actually, in the United States, he's considered to be one of the most fragile athletes of all professional sport over a course of time. And maybe he missed these number of games. That's probably why his career lasted so long. But I suppose the general message is you can't necessarily tell by uh, initially looking at an athlete whether they may be fragile or not. So how do we recognize fragility? Well, the easiest, I suppose, approach would be just recognizing a fragility injury uh, when we see it. And we talk about fragility injuries often in relation to bone injuries. So bone stress fractures are often uh, categorized into those that are fragility. In other words, they shouldn't have happened um, or um, traumatic, one expects them to happen. And although we have that mindset with bone stress injuries, uh, we sometimes forget to ask ourselves, um, should basic muscular soft tissue, uh, soft tissue strain injuries happen? You know, a grade one hamstring tear, often people don't stop to think, hang on a minute here, um, should this have happened and why, why has it necessarily happened in this athlete? Or the patient who presents with an inflammatory insertional Achilles tendon problem, why? And could there be an underlying disease process like psoriasis? So the, the first step to recognizing fragility is perhaps recognizing it through the initial presentation. But we probably have an awful lot more patients who we recognize as being fragile because they keep turning up to practice. Recurrent injuries um, or presenting with a number of different injuries over the course of time, soft tissue and or bone. Um, a fragile athlete would be considered to be one who is returning to play with an active injury, as so many high-performance athletes do um, under the circumstances of their contracts. Um, patients who have underlying diseases, um, underlying deficiencies, vitamin disease, vitamin deficiencies. Um, and the patient who is slower to recover or slower to return to play, um, sometimes it's get a, it, we lose sight of how long it's actually taking uh, an athlete to get back to play, but those individuals should be picked out as being the fragile athlete. Um, individuals who have recurrent illnesses, not necessarily because there's something systemically wrong with them, but they have long periods of time out, and every time they come back into sport, their injury um, vulnerability is quite high. And also patients with uh, mental health issues, just because, as I'll discuss, it will affect their ability to go through the rehab process. So lots of different ways of describing and recognizing uh, fragility in an athlete. Now, an athlete might be fragile in some environments, and they might not be fragile in other environments, or might be fragile under certain um, coaching environments, um, but not in others. The sport obviously has a big role because um, individuals tend to get selected into the sports that they're more resilient in, but that's not always the case. But when we come back to the actual essential makeup um, of the athlete, 
uh, those are the factors that really when we're screening athletes and looking at them and looking for ri risk factors, uh, those are the things that we're particularly interested in in the, in the clinic. So these factors, we'll all recognize these. Being female is um, a high risk and uh, multiplies the risk of lower limb injuries several fold and much slower to respond to rehabilitation. Now, that's often um, claimed to be because of the link to hypermobility, but actually it's much more linked to the um, tendency towards uh, proprioceptive deficits and lack of trunk control. So we certainly recognize a much higher incidence of um, ACL uh, ruptures in female athletes in high impact sports, and to some extent, but not quite extreme, ankle injuries as well. Now I mentioned hypermobility, and we blame hypermobility for a lot, really. Everything, oh, you're hypermobile. Hypermobility isn't the diagnosis, it's usually the start of the diagnosis. Um, and there are many individuals who will perform at high level in sport and actually be very resilient, totally resilient to it. So it's the difficulty of part of our research into hypermobility is the fact that we don't necessarily distinguish between those who are hypermobile with big proprioceptive and de deficits and trunk control movement pattern issues and those who actually are reasonably stable and function very well and, and uh, safely. Uh, if you look at most of the research studies in hypermobility and sport, you will not see these features looked at to try to strategize, uh, uh, stratify between the different groups. So hypermobility in male footballers, uh, much higher incidence of um, injuries in general versus, uh, versus non-hypermobile uh, players, a five, five to six fold increased likelihood of sustaining a significant knee injury. But actually, if you look at the evidence base for ankle injuries, much as we blame hypermobility for high predisposition to ankle injuries, there's actually not a lot of evidence for that, certainly not in football anyway. So it, ankle restriction is much more likely to make the athlete uh, vulnerable or fragile uh, than it is uh, hypermobility. So it is um, diff uh, different horses for courses, really. It's, it depends upon the sport and it depends upon the specific underlying characteristics. Now, just moving on to the more um, uh, body weight aspects of, of sport, and, and I mentioned uh, the archetypical fragile athlete, um, and we know that this um, combination of low body mass, low body fat, um, and low energy intake leads on to what we call classically the female athlete triad. Um, and, you know, when one sees an athlete of this type of physical makeup, it's something you're going to think about pretty quickly in terms of uh, their health risks. Um, and we know that the, the threshold for adverse to effects to happen, which I'll describe in a minute, in other words, changes in endocrine function, changes in musculoskeletal healing, problems with bone health, tend to happen when energy intake drops below 30 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. So there is a threshold at which um, the body just can't compensate. So um, the lack of energy availability um, really meet, tips the balance and it means that everything slows down. Hormonal function, bone metabolism, soft tissue healing, metabolic factors, uh, reproductive pathways, etc. So everything slows down in order to try to make energy available um, to just survive. Uh, and that's the principle of this um, athletic triad that, that we discuss. Now, the, the group are in, who are in the red zone here are the easy group to pick up. And these are the ones who don't have periods. They have um, easy bone stress injuries. They have um, uh, eating disorders usually. It's rarely unintentional the eating deficiencies. Um, but actually the difficulty is that a lot of the people that we see who come in and they have recurrent injuries, whether they're recurrent soft tissue injuries, they're recurrent bone injuries, or they're just slow to heal, will fall into this group here where it's clinically much more difficult to pick these up. So really screening individuals for, for their eating patterns, watching their weight, um, and looking at their exercise levels that, and effectively then their energy balance is, is really important. And this slide is really to say this is the group that we easily pick up uh, with uh, the so-called athlete triad, and the rest of them are the ones that have subclinical hormone dysfunction, uh, 
um, that will have soft tissue injuries and bone injuries that are difficult to see. So you can actually test for these, you can test for different hormonal problems, but you know, you have to initially uh, put the key in the door to start doing the tests. Uh, historically, uh, female athletes, this is why this is called the female athlete triad, but I see probably 25-30% of my cases of athletic triad patients are male and they have the same type of responses to thinness and um, reduced hormone function, etc. And they will often present with the same type of scenario of, of uh, fragility in terms of easy injuries and slow recovery. Now, what about the excessive body weight? The, the, the theory about Shaquille O'Neal, if you look at his career and the pictures of him through his career, he's a big, big guy and he was often quite fat, actually. Um, and a lot of his body weight was um, upper body. And one of the theories about excessive adiposity, even in top class athletes, is that it's pro-inflammatory. So it continues to drive the injury. Uh, then there are the obvious mechanical effects of carrying excessive body weight. And what we don't know is when an athlete has got an intra-articular injury, for example, or a lower patellar tendinopathy, what is the ideal body weight for that athlete? Because they usually have to be lighter to compensate for their injury, um, but they may not be uh, they may be too light to continue successfully with resilience in their sport. <clears throat> so it's an interesting question, and I don't think we've really uh, teased that out very far. Fragility due to medical conditions. There are all sorts of different types of medical conditions, and effectively most of them can predispose to um, impaired soft tissue healing, uh, vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency, any types of um, uh, hormone disease. Um, so effectively, that would be picked up in a medical screen. It's not to say that the individual is necessarily more fragile, but they are, more, they are potentially more fragile. Now, to touch on screening, um, how do we detect the fragile athlete? We've talked about recognizing the pattern of uh, an injury or a set of injuries that come in the door, slowness of return to play. But when, we, you know, when we're looking at our athletes and we're taking hist a history and looking back on things, it's just taking all of these factors into consideration. That, that is the start of the screening program. Of course, as far as physiotherapy goes, much of uh, seeing athletes um, uh, sort of seasonally, annually, is to screen uh, people. And for every different sport, there will be different screening um, systems that may or may not be... Um, transferable to other sports and there are very few tests that are really transferable from one group of athletes to another so I think it's very difficult to say use one screening system and that will identify everything this is the um, star balance excursion test which is said to be one of the most reliable single functional movement screening tests that there is compared to a lot of the other ones that are published whether that's um, uh, true or not, um, I don't know, but certainly it seems to be um, a reasonably valid, simple screen. There are other screens that seem to be very oversimplistic that are talked about and looking for vulnerabilities and joint range of motion and trunk control, uh, flexibility, proprioception. And then p people have published on looking at, well, if, can, you, can you predict uh, injury risk from, and therefore fragility from these types of um, uh, from these types of screening uh, modeling. And if you look at um, this, uh, this publication was about the functional movement screen, which is a very simplistic set of tests, I have to say. Um, and it looks at the fact that if you have um, uh, an individual who's had a past history of injury and is poor on functional movement testing, then that you, one can come up with a likelihood ratio. And I put all of this in simply because actually I don't think it's as simple as all of that. And a, a lot of it comes down to clinical judgment about seeing your athlete and knowing your athlete and understanding that they seem to be not responding in the way they are or they are presenting with complaints that they shouldn't be. And I think that to, to some extent is a, maybe a simplistic approach, but it certainly is um, a clinically relevant one. And then just lastly, in terms of the um, factors that might drive injuries. Um, this is a paper from young about young athletes in, in a variety of different sports and anxiety, mistrust, negative coping strategies and, uh, and stress um, all contribute to um, the risk of injury, not just the poor recovery from them. Last section is um, to talk about the fragile athlete that we recognize as being one who is 
being slow in returning to play and the predictors of time uh, that's taken to successfully return to play. In other words, those who are slow are those who uh, have a severe injury or are trying to return after a recurrence of the injury. Um, patients who present late with their injury. Uh, females, again, probably for the same reasons that I described before about proprioceptive and uh, trunk uh, control. Um, the, co the extremes of body composition. So again, you know, carrying uh, extra weight when you've had a knee injury back into your sport. Similarly, low bone mass and nutritional deficiencies will always remain uh, people, the, the group who are extremely slow to respond to, to treatment. And one of the really interesting aspects of all of this is that if you look at one of the strongest predictive <coughs> factors of returning to play, it's self-efficacy. So it's basically confidence and an optimistic outlook in terms of, uh, in terms of um, their injury and their insight and their, their um, uh, sort of engagement with the rehabilitation process. And if you look at most musculoskeletal conditions and most musculoskeletal diseases from severe inflammatory arthritis through to injuries, you'll find that self-efficacy often will come out as being one of the top predictive factors of an individual's return to function, to work, to sport, to whatever. Um, and so, don't worry, you don't have to read this, um, but there are um, simple self-efficacy scores that you can give to patients and you can actually use it in, as a point of discussion about how patients manage themselves. What is this one? Pardon? What is this one? Uh, I can't remember. This yeah, is, the one uh, I don't know, but oh, I mean, it'll be in your slides, so. Um, so, Another thing, the negative predictors of return to play, again, similar things, stress and anxiety, fear, I'm going to get beaten up, um, but fear actually more that, fear of re-injury, isn't it? This is something that we deal with all the time, that actually, particularly athletes coming back after uh, stress fractures, they don't know how to uh, interpret uh, sensations that they got from the injured area. Lack of motivation in rehabilitation and lack of good social support during that rehabilitation phase. And, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of um, uh, research that, that suggests that um, these two issues, the engagement with the rehab and the social support issues, are um, very important. And again, one can measure, and this will be in your slides, we, you can measure readiness to return to play. Because if an athlete isn't psychologically ready, there's no way that they should be returning. And that, that is obvious, but it's a bit like saying to a patient saying to us, am I vulnerable on the ski slopes? And if you ask them, well, are you confident on the ski slopes? And they say no, then you say there, well, you're vulnerable then. It's as simple as that. It's often not about the physical injury. It's about the um, psychological state. And I'll just finish, if I can, um, with a note on resilience. Because I've talked about fragility. Um, and to focus on fragility when we're in the process of treating our patients is maybe not the right way around it. What we really should be trying to promote in all of them is resilience. And resilience training in this context, uh, a f short flick serve um, in the final point of a badminton final, um, is what high performance sport pour into athletes now. It's the resi psychological resilience of pressure and stress. Now, from a medical perspective, we would um, describe things as being physical resilience and there are a lot of genetic studies that have looked at this type of thing in um, certain groups of athletes and looking at why individuals are able to cope with vast amounts of training and, and uh, physiological stress more than others and I'll return to my um, uh, original slide um, of this lady and she's a good example of this because I gave a, a talk on about, I spieled on for about an hour about bone health and the fragile athlete and how um, treacherous it all was in endurance athletes, et cetera, et cetera. And Liz McColgan followed me onto the podium and uh, in about three seconds had undone everything I'd said because she said, well, um, I've had five pregnancies. I've had a total of 10 to 14 days off each pregnancy. Um, in terms of training, I've not had a bone stress injury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are some outliers, and so you can't necessarily tell by looking at them. But as far as resilience goes, resilience is actually, from our perspective, it's the psychological side of managing injury, and there is no um, uh, serious athlete who really hasn't um, uh, pot potentially 
constructively been through an injury and hasn't learned the psychological resilience that they, they need to. And resilience comes into all aspects of life, really. But actually, we maybe should focus more on this when we're talking to our younger athletes who've got injuries, talking them through processes of, um, uh, of resilience and how to cope with injuries uh, very much as a learning experiential process because they're likely to have to go through it again. And again, like everything else, uh, you can measure um, resilience in people and um, give some insight into uh, where they sit on the, on the grand scale of things. And there are books and there are websites on resilience that, that can actually be quite good in, just t in terms of giving your patient some uh, reading information to, uh, to fall back on. So I'll finish there. Um, big, big topic, fragile athlete. I've touched on a few very simple areas. Um, but you could really leave, be left with the conclusion that there are an awful lot of fragile athletes out there and maybe we overlook some of those that we need to um, uh, treat in a different way. Um, and uh, always consider them when patients are presenting with uh, recurrent injuries or slow to recover injuries. But the, the psychological aspects and the resilience training in a lot of these patients will go um, sometimes much further than some of the physical elements will. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to follow on from Cathy's um, talk about spines and resilience, if you like. Um, any guesses who this chap is? Not Father Christmas. Um, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not particularly religious, um, but if you want to get resilience, get religion. So this is a study that they took religious and non-religious people, and they electrocuted them. They gave them an electrical signal to their hand, and they asked them how painful it was. Then they took the religious group and showed them a religious icon, and a non-religious icon, and if they were viewing a religious icon or what they had a belief in, so different religions, they hurt less. Okay, so if you have a belief, you're going to be more resilient. And of course, what I picture I showed you, of course, is I won't go into that was Karl Marx, isn't it? And he said, "Opium is the religion of the people." Well, he was true, hundred years ago, neurobiology. But actually, you know, we can all get re resilience different ways. So this is a question I'm often asked as a, a spine doc: you know, will I get better after a surgery? Okay, and I'm going to go through some of the factors of that. Um, but what's this got to do with what the Rolling Stones and the Wizard of Oz? What's that got to do with spine surgery? Now, that's what we understand about pain mechanisms. Don't try and take that down. <laughs> that's probably better, isn't it? That's 300 years old. That's Cartesian logic. And, of course, being French, he said, fire, input, rings a series of tubules, you draw away. That's pain. That's still true today, but of course in orthopaedic minds, what that says is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the stimulus and the expression, and we know that's not true. We know now that it's modulatable at all levels, transduction, transmission, and perception. And whether it's your anti-inflammatory soup and your non-steroidals, or whether it's your confidence in the perception, people will react differently, they'll rehab differently, and that's some of that's in our hands. I'm going to talk a bit about MRIs in a mo. I'm going to let you know that bra if you are in pain, your brain's going to shrink. I don't know if you knew that. All right. The good thing is if you can cure it, your brain comes back. Okay. And it's all this, isn't it? It's the DJ playing your spinal cord. Okay. Your central sensitization, your fibromyalgics. You'll see people with up and down, and you can modulate this. I think this is actually going to go through the whole lot, isn't it? So let me just take you through. This is true of hips. And it's through shoulders, isn't it? If you have an arthroscopic decompression and you've got neural sensitivity, you've got allodynia, everyone know what allodynia is, irritation, pain down the arm, you do less well, rehabilitation-wise, than you wouldn't. So it's looking at what's gone central, what the neuropathic processes are. Um, and most people, if you're going to have a discectomy surgery, you'll do very well. 89% of people will do very well. We know that's true. There's a small tail that won't, OK? Um, the nice thing about this, and this is a sports trial, of course, is at five years and at ten years, your outcome's the same, <coughs> whether you have surgery or not for ridiculous pain. That's quite good prognostically. Surgery, you'll get better quicker. We know that. You'll be back on the running track quicker, so it has its place. But people shouldn't be fearful that if they don't have surgery, they're not going to do as well. First two years, yes. Five, ten years, no. Okay. So it's all about picking your right target, <laughs> isn't it? The right patient. <coughs> and that's the spinal pathway, isn't it? Fed down by nice... And what you guys probably all do 
whether you do it in a structured way with a questionnaire or whether you do it mentally, is you assess your patient, don't you? And you triage them. We all know about yellow flags and red flags. Effectively, when the patient walks through the door, you're this, isn't it? What you want is Dorothy. Because Dorothy's a coper. Whatever you do, she's going to be back out on the running track. She's going to do well. How you treat Dorothy is going to be quite different from how you treat the fear avoidant lion there. Because he needs difference. We don't put them through the same rehab program. We don't expect the same outcomes. They shouldn't expect <coughs> the same outcomes. We're going to have to handle them differently. And I think that's quite well established from your early onset in your back pain. I'll go past that. But where it's not really established is when you go down to see a surgeon. And why expecting your rehab to be different? And what we really need to do is look at the Dorothys and the Lions when they're approaching surgery, and I'll explain why. Half of us will have some back pain in this year. Less than 10% will go to a surgeon, or go to a doctor, or go to your GP, one in 10. And less than 40% of that will actually be bothered. You can't put on your hosiery. And 40% will be extremely bothered. You can't go to work. And that's probably the people that wash up at your door first. That's still 100,000 people in London. And of those 100,000, you are four times more likely to have anxiety and depression if you have back pain. So if they fail the pathway, and gladly it's not many, go down that pathway to be presented to a surgeon, they're much more likely to have psychopathology and how do we deal with that. And we know from the study of 4,000 people around the world that in the US, in Spain, in England, it's the same. So there's a high level of anxiety. And if you can't go to work and if you can't provide for your family, you're going to be anxious. Or it may be that you had anxiety and depression and you're more likely to get back pain. Of course, so it's important to pick out Dorothy and the lion. And of course, expectation is the key to that, isn't it? It's how we understand. And this in this paper, less than 20% of people having spinal surgery will actually think we've exceeded their expectations. 40% we won't come up to their expectations. So it's important to understand what the patient's goals are and what we're going through to make them right. And interestingly, when we look at disability and MRI, there's very little in it. Everyone knows what modic change is. Everyone heard of Hannah Albert and the antibiotics, probably going to come back in a year or two's time, probably some merit, but not the 40%. But of all these things, degenerative disease, herniated disc, annular tears, prolapsed disc, there's very little apart from modic change that suggests long-term disability. Distress is far and away the greatest predictor of disability of spinal pain. So it's important to take that into account and what your outcomes and expectations are. And when we looked at that, clinical impressions of patients before surgery, they are surgeons and non-surgeons, physicians, who could pick out who's going to do well. And the surgeons didn't do badly, 20% got it right, comparatively. 40% of the non-operative <coughs> surgeons were better at assessing patients' outcomes, not from a surgical point of view, not from a bit of metalwork point of view, but actually their long-term outcomes. And it will come as no surprise to you guys that if you smoke, if you abuse substances, if you've been off work, if you're not enjoying work, these are going to have different outcomes. And we should assess these people in different ways. If you've got a high pain sensitivity, fibromyalgia, polysomatic, if you're depressed, if you're anxiety, we should look at these. And you should construct these red, yellow, green, amber, green. That's not to say you don't need surgery, because you, sometimes you will need surgery, but to expect to follow the same pathway is different. We should look at these in a different way. What do we think is the biggest predictor of outcome in any spinal surgery? One question. Do you think you'll be back at work? 20 times odds ratio of predicting where you're going to be at three to six months. If, if your patient says to you, I don't think I'll be back at work, I'm not keen to go back to work, they're going to be right. Okay? But that's all psychology. That's not whether you fuse one level, put a disc replacement in. It's all the psychology behind that. And we need to handle that differently because we can modulate it, as you heard from Cathy. So there we are. So 20% change. Now, in all surgery, depression is thought to have a bad outcome. But that's not true, as you may have heard. And what happens is that those people who are anxious and depressed, because they've got pain, and it's a short-term reactive, and when you take that pain away, they get better. And there are those people that are anxious and depressed who then had back pain, and that doesn't get better. And we need to handle those in a different way. And when actually we looked at that, or when actually the Cambridge neurosurgeons looked at that, they looked at 100 cases, 
they showed actually whether you had psychopathology, anxiety and depression, you reacted on the same trajectory. You, went, you improved the same. But you were polysymptomatic before, you remain polysymptomatic. And sometimes, I'm sure you've seen this, people anchor. If only my surgery had gone better, if only my rehabilitation got better, this wouldn't have happened to me, these life events wouldn't happen to me. So they forget how they were before, they pin a lot of hopes on that. And it's important to make those changes and say, look, actually, we're going to get you better, your leg pain's going to be better, but you're going to be the same person. And of course, that's the Rolling Stones, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't get what you want, but you get what you need. You'll get back. Okay. Um, and there are some changes you can do. I'm not going to concentrate on that, we're going to have to take some questions. But pregabalin, people have heard of pregabalin, the neural mod modulator. Um, quite profound changes. If you have 300 milligrams of pregabalin twice a day for 48 hours around your spinal surgery, you'll be, have less pain and greater function at three months. Now, it the effect <coughs> tends to have changed at a year. You will, you've gone back to the norm. But in your early rehab, you'll be better. So if you get these people, treating them differently, there are things you can do, there's cognitive behavioural therapy, but looking at different pathways for them are important. But science is important. I don't know if you've seen this one at Turkey. 24 patients were given cotton underpants. <laughs> 24 were given woolen underpants. And if you wear woolen underpants for three months, your back pain's better. So it can put us all out of a job. <laughs> so, just remember. Treat Dorothy and the fear avoidant line differently. It's not all in the head and it's not all in the MRI, but it's somewhere in between. But your expectations of what you're telling the patient when they're going for any intervention, be it spinal surgery, has got to be different. There are things that we can do. And of course, that's why this guy you saw before, William Osler, is important. And of course, he said, the good physician treats person, but the great physician treats the patient with the disease. And that's, of course, what you guys do. Thank you. <laughs>